I mean, if uh, if you doubt that your yourself is in pain, you know, then just to give one quick example because of time restrictions, think of a time where you were uh, standing somewhere and you said, man, I just kind of want to have a seat instead of standing. Why? Who cares? What's the difference, standing or sitting? Because one involves a little bit of pain that by sitting you can avoid. That's just an example of how just an ordinary experience in daily life can involve pain. Uh, that's just one of a zillion examples I can give. But see, marijuana gets rid of all that. Go uh, find yourself in a situation where you're doing something that kind of involves some pain, like walking up a steep hill or shoveling dog poop or something like that, and do it without cannabis and then do it with. I'm sure all of, a lot of you have experienced this. You see that in one, in the pre-cannabis consciousness, uh, your mental state involves you know, kind of an inner pain, an, an inner pain of some sort. But when cannabis is introduced, man, it's it's gone, gone. The inner pain is gone. It's almost, to put it in a philosophical way, it's almost an Epicurean situation. Epicurus was an ancient Greek philosopher who was called a hedonist. He developed the philosophy of hedonism, which has changed a little bit through the year, through the centuries. Uh, boy, he sp he didn't mean something like pornography or something like that, which people usually refer to the word hedonism to describe. Uh, but what he meant he, by hedonism is the pursuit of pure pleasure, where pure pleasure was specifically defined as the removal of inner pain, okay, and where you have uh, deep inner joy that replaces it. Well, if that's the case, then cannabis is an Epicurean, hedonistic, uh, philosophical uh, plant, which is simply for humanity is a miracle. Okay, I mean, it, it's really, the, yeah, I guess we can say that cannabis is really the most valuable item on planet Earth in a philosophical sense. And, you know, Buddhists would probably agree, too, because the whole religion of Buddhism is, is uh, based on trying to remove that inner, that deep inner pain, which usually people don't even notice because they're not looking in at themselves to notice that's there, that it's there. Usually instead they're just sort of uh, affected by it and controlled by it without knowing it's there, sort of like a dog that's getting stung in the butt and doesn't know what's going on. It's jumping around, ouch, 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 uh, and doesn't know what's going on. That's kind of what humans are like. Um, so in a Buddhistic sense and an Epicurean sense, marijuana is the most valuable thing to humans on planet Earth. It removes inner tension, all right? Okay, let's get to a big issue. Let's go right to the brain damage issue. You know, everybody, all the old people you talk to, oh, cannabis, it's going to fry your brain. You know, remember that stupid commercial with that dumb, grumpy old guy back in the 1980s and 90s that have the pants in there saying, see this? And they said, this is your brain. Then he put an egg in it and said, this is your brain on drugs. Of course, you know, he's using this term drugs to refer to anything from... Well, apparently he's not considering alcohol or t nicotine, maybe, but you know anything from heroin to cocaine, you probably throw marijuana in there, as if these things all act the same. So, but of course the public follow along with that stupid commercial as if it's precise in any way. But here's what it says uh, in 161. I'll just tell you what what happens. There's simply no um, evidence that this book, Science of Marijuana, can find in any way that uh, cannabis uh, damages the brain at all. Page 161, there have, been men, there have been claims that chronic cannabis use may permanently uh, damage the brain, but there's little scientific, little scientific evidence to support this. Several footnotes follow to support this. Uh, and then it describes some of how, uh, talking about very heavy users were studied. I mean, they went down to Jamaica and were studying people that were smoking, you know, five joints a day, 35 years and so forth. The study, for if there was any brain damage, found none. Okay. You know, it talks here on the bottom of page 161, you know, authors were giving rats just huge doses of cannabis, failed to find any kind of damage in the rat cortical uh, brain tissue. You know, same with monkeys and dogs. So uh, here's what they say in 162. The mixed reports of the neurotoxic and neuroprotective effects of cannabis are, con cannabinoids are confusing. While it may be possible to demonstrate neurotoxic effect, after exposure of neurons to high concentrations of cannabinoids in vitro, there is little evidence for any significant neural damage in vivo after the administration of pharmaceutically relevant doses of the drugs. Now, so due to time constraints, I'm going to just tell you some other stuff that was found. They also went to Jamaica and studied pregnant women who were stoned constantly, must have been smoking three to five joints a day. And they studied the, the babies and the kids, and they traced them until the kids were in their late teens and early 20s and everything appeared perfectly normal except for one side effect 
And guess what the side effect was? The children of these mothers appeared to be more calm than other people. Okay, this is on page 169 of the book. You know, there's just so much information in this book. 171 talks about increased immune efficient, the immune system, footnotes everywhere, helps with mental illness. Uh, apparently doesn't help with schizophrenia, which I wasn't that surprised about. Well, I guess it's you know, saying here the results are kind of mixed. Now, let's go back to the children issue. Now, that also is here in 166 and 167. They're talking about how people that smoke a huge amount for decades may have one side effect. Okay, and here, let me read to you on page 167, which is, I mean, so-called side effect. It's not really a side effect. All right, they're talking about the, uh, let me just read. It says, the results suggested that subjects were unable to reject complex irrelevant information and hence less able to focus their attention effectively. In other words, they suffered from a deficit of selective attention, a process that is necessary for successful completion of most cognitive tasks. Although these deficits may not have much impact on the ability of ex-marijuana smokers to function normally, add further weight to the conclusion that marijuana smoke, that marijuana tends to impair the executive function of the brain, where the executive function is defined here earlier in the page. says so subtle cognitive impairments can be observed uh, the um, in the complex information organization in uh, consciousness known as the executive function. I think what that really, that's very vague information, but I think what that's, what I interpret that as is the marijuana smokers are just more at peace. They're less concerned with the world. It's almost a spiritual, you know, you know how the religions talk about the world as being less important than the domain of spirit. You know, Jesus saying don't collect in don't collect what moth corrodes and rust destroys. And, you know, the Buddha was a uh, homeless uh, wanderer for most of his life, or, after, you know, from what, I, what I've heard, um, according to the legends of the Buddha. So, you know, it just seems to be that marijuana spiritualizes a person. It makes one less interested in, you know, the industrial civilization that we live in. And people may interpret this as mental illness, but it's probably really just better interpreted as spiritual fulfillment. Anyway, everybody, I got to go. This... This show is uh, running overdue. Okay, take uh, take care. Bye.